Hi, I'm Torian Barber. Welcome to Ask the ACE Faculty, the 2011 Anaphylaxis Community Experts broadcast offered in partnership by the Allergy and Asthma Network, Mothers of Asthmatics, and the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. This program is supported by Day Pharma. Now, what started as a pilot program in 2010 with 158 teams is now an award-winning national campaign with 300 participating ACE teams. Together, we're changing what people know and do about anaphylaxis. We're saving lives. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Philip Lieberman, Clinical Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics in Internal Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Tennessee College of Medicine in Memphis. Thank you, Tarian. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Ask the ACE faculty. Uh, we had such a great response from the first ACE broadcast that we're back to address some of the unanswered questions that came from our last show. We've got a great panel of experts, uh, and they include all board-certified allergists who are internationally known uh, anaphylaxis experts. Dr. Nowak Wergzen uh, is uh, an associate professor at Mount Sinai Medical School. Dr. David Golden is an associate professor at Johns Hopkins. And Dr. Dana, Dana Wallace is uh, uh, an assistant professor at NOVA and also president of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Today's broadcast is an interactive conversation with you. First, We'll present three case studies and a question after each. Answers will be tabulated and then shown in aggregate uh, on the presentation window. We'll discuss cases and answers together. Later, we'll move into the lightning round, where, uh, as the name implies, we'll have an interaction that will be fast-paced and lively. So let's get started with Anna's first case study which is based on an actual patient with a food allergy. Anna? Thank you, Phil. This case study is about a 37-year-old man with a long history of allergic rhinitis and mild intermittent asthma who developed acute urticaria and shortness of breath approximately 30 minutes after eating pecans. He was treated in the emergency department with an albuterol inhalation and Benadryl intramuscular injection and later discharge. The question for the ACE teams to answer is, did this patient receive appropriate treatment? If yes, please choose A. If no, please choose B. When you hear the music begin, you will see the countdown clock on the screen. You'll have 14 seconds to answer the question. All right, time's up. Anna, we have a few moments as we're waiting for the results to come in. Was the patient treated appropriately, or was he just lucky? Boy, was he lucky. Like, he just won a lottery and he won his life. Well, he clearly did not receive a appropriate treatment for anaphylaxis. He was treated for asthma and a skin rash, which unfortunately happens too often in the emergency department. Which is so important to recognize that if those symptoms from various organ systems occur together, they are anaphylactic and then epinephrine has to be used as soon as this is recognized. Anaphylactic reaction can progress so rapidly that people can die within minutes. And epinephrine is the only medicine that uh, sort of counteracts the effects uh, of uh, anaphylaxis. So it's definitely the only medicine to use as early as possible. Good discussion. Let's see what our uh, ACE team uh, uh, had to say about this question. Uh, Anna, can you uh, interpret the slide for us? Well, the ACE teams answered yes um, in 10%, but the vast majority chose the correct answer, no. So uh, we got the message across that uh, epinephrine is the first-line treatment of anaphylaxis. Dave, what do you have to say? Well, those, those are some really important points. And you know, maybe what we need to always be aware of is, as Anna said, is just how rapidly 
reactions and fatal reactions can happen. Uh, fatal reactions can, can occur within minutes, within 15 minutes for insecting allergy, uh, 15 to 30 minutes for food, uh, even faster for injectable uh, allergens. And epinephrine is the only treatment that may prevent that. If it's given early enough, even waiting too long with the epinephrine, it may not work. So epinephrine is the only treatment, and it has to be given early enough. Dana. Well, again, we're reminded they made the right decision, but some of our patients and emergency room physicians don't always make the right decision. And they will administer Benadryl, which takes 60 minutes to start working, or steroids, which take four to six hours. And these drugs do not counteract anaphylaxis. They are always second-line drugs. Well, let's look at the take-home messages from this case. Anaphylaxis can progress rapidly, and death can occur quite quickly. It can occur in minutes. Uh, epinephrine rapidly targets the multiple mediators, uh, whereas an antihistamine does not. From now, let's go on to our next case study, and David, you take that one. Thanks, Bill. This case is about an insect allergy patient. This 16-year-old male was stung by a bee and suffered acute urticaria, shortness of breath, and dizziness. After emergency department treatment with epinephrine, cortisone, and oxygen, he was released with a prescription for two two-packs of epinephrine auto-injectors. That's four injectors. The mother instructed her son to carry one. She left the second one in the school clinic, kept one in her purse, and one at home, thinking this way she was covering all her bases. If her son was stung, wherever he was, he'd be protected against a fatal anaphylactic reaction. Did the mother make the right choices here? If Yes, choose A. If no, choose B. Time's up. David, while we wait for the audience answers to come in, uh, what do you and the rest of the panel think? Did this mom make the right choice? I'll give mom credit. She really tried hard. And she definitely had the right ideas, covering all the bases, making sure that epinephrine injectors will be available wherever her son might land up getting stung and having a reaction. But I think mom is not really keeping in mind the reason that we prescribe two doses. We don't prescribe two doses so that they can be spread around to all different places. We prescribe two doses because two doses may be needed for any single reaction. There are a lot of reasons for that. The reaction can be very severe, sometimes so severe that multiple doses of epinephrine are needed. The reaction can be prolonged. It can go on for hours and require multiple doses. Or it may be biphasic, uh, meaning that it goes away. And this can really fool people. It gets better and everything seems fine. And then a few hours later, it comes back, sometimes even worse than it was before, and may require another dose. There are so many possible reasons that two doses may be needed. And we see this in published statistics, that up to 35% of cases of anaphylaxis require two or more doses of epinephrine. Anna. Well, you know, we always train our patients very well how to use the auto-injector, and we make them show us how they're going to do it before they leave the office. But at the time of an emergency, either the patient or the caretaker sometimes just forgets. They push the wrong button, and they miss their target. The medicine goes flying in the air. And now they have a backup. They have a spare tire if they have two on board. Anna? Well, it is so important to have those two auto-injectors because one in three anaphylactic reactions will actually require additional doses of epinephrine. And one of the w other uh, reasons why uh, one dose may not be sufficient is that we only have two doses available to us in those auto-injectors. And some of those may be underdosing certain patients, such as, you know, older child, or an, a big sort of obese person. So everybody has to have two at all times. Also, you know, it's important to say that, especially when uh, they're traveling or they're away from medical care, this is even more critical uh, to have them available. I think there's also sometimes, uh, maybe all too often, the feeling that the reaction wasn't that bad. So certainly one would be enough. And, and I think the important point is that the severity of anaphylaxis is really hard to predict. It's, it, you can't predict it based on the last reaction. You can't predict it based on the skin test sensitivity. You need to always be prepared for the severe reaction. 
Great discussion. Now let's see what our ACE team members thought about this, month, this, this, this question. Dave, take a look at what uh, the ACE team members said. The ACE team members did pretty well, actually. Uh, they answered that mom was not right. 85% uh, of the ACE teams answered no, 15% answered yes. And I'm sure that there were many who answered yes because mom did do the right thing as far as making it available in all these different places. But we're going to emphasize the need to have two doses available in every location. Dana? You know, some of my patients ask me if they can divide the, the doses because they want to save money. And obviously they're not saving money in the long run if there is an emergency. But I would like to inform our listeners that most insurance companies will cover at least two two-packs. So again, that same copay will get them four injectors and they can keep it in two separate places and if need be, perhaps even order more. Anna, you have anything to add to that? Well, I, I guess just to say better safe than sorry. Yes, yeah, I think we all agree with that. So from this case, let's look at the take home messages. First, up to 35% of episodes require two doses. Second, uh, there is no way, absolutely no way, to predict who will require more than one dose. Dana, you have the next case, uh, and it's an interesting case because it focuses on oral food allergy and what to do about it. Yes, this is a very interesting case, and I want you to pay very special attention because it's a little different type of food allergy. Here we have a 15-year-old girl who develops itching of her mouth, soft palate, and ears after eating a fresh, delicious apple or a pear. She also notices that these symptoms when she eats fresh vegetables, carrots and celery. The symptoms have grown steadily worse over the past two years, and recently they have been accompanied by a dry cough. So the question for our audience is, should the provider prescribe an auto-injector of epinephrine for this patient? If yes, please choose A. If no, please choose B. Time's up. Now, while waiting for the results, tell us a little bit more about oral food allergy syndrome and pollen food allergy syndrome. This case emphasizes that indeed there are pollen sensitivity which cross react with food allergens. And we saw in the case that apples and pears have cross reacting or homologous allergens that are present in birch. Likewise, we could see that melon has homologous allergens in ragweed. So again, we have to be aware of this when our patients discuss their food allergy symptoms. Let's now go and talk about a new terminology, pollen food allergy syndrome. What is that? It is a combination of oral allergy syndrome and systemic symptoms. This emphasizes that up to 10% of patients with oral symptoms will at some point develop a systemic symptom. To make that diagnosis, you have to have four components. The first is you do have to have oral allergy symptoms. The second is you have to have sensitization to a pollen, usually symptoms, but you must have a positive skin test. The third is you have to have a positive skin test or sensitization to a plant food. Now we usually start with a commercial extract and do the testing, but if it's negative, we cannot stop there. We have to do what's called the prick, prick test. You'll take that fruit, and you'll prick through the skin into the fruit, and then you'll prick the patient. This is a much more sensitive method of testing because many of these allergens are heat labile. So even in producing the commercial extract, you will destroy the allergen. And the fourth and final component to make the diagnosis is there must be a known correlation between that pollen and the food in question. Well, let's see how our ACE team have answered this question. Well, you know, we're mixed on this. When would you give the patient with this type of problem an automatic epinephrine injector? 
You know, that's, that's not an easy question to answer for oral food allergy and pollen food allergy syndrome because allergists don't agree on that all the time. I think that I would have given this patient an auto-injector because I would have identified or been concerned that that dry cough was a systemic reaction. And any time there is a systemic reaction to any food, you want to provide an auto-injector. There may be some other situations when you want to consider it in pollen food allergy syndrome. When the allergen is peanut, tree nut, peach, or mustard, these are associated with more severe reactions. If the patient reacts not only to the fresh food but to the cooked food, it either means a higher degree of sensitivity or a heat-stable allergen. And likewise, if you're positive on that commercial uh, extract, it probably also means you're at risk. And the fifth and final consideration is if the patient asks you for it. Anytime a patient asks me to provide an auto-injector, I am more than willing to do so as long as they'll carry and use it when appropriate. Dave, you want to add anything to that? It's, it, it, as Dana said, this is such a difficult problem uh, because it's so easy to say, oh, that's nothing, it's minor, they just get an itchy mouth and throat. But Dana outlined some five very important uh, scenarios where we really should be thinking to prescribe an epinephrine injector because we know that 10% can develop systemic symptoms, especially to certain foods. So it's a hard decision for the allergist to make, but we have to look for the right reasons and we have to recognize that they are in danger, potentially. And Anna? Well, I'm really glad that we're discussing this case because, you know, pollen food allergy syndrome and allergy to fruits and vegetables is probably the most common food allergy ever. It affects from 30 to 75% of people who are allergic to birch pollen. And um, sometimes it's not, it's not being reported. You have to ask about it um, because patients don't volunteer this information. I think the, the, the most important thing about this case was really also the progression of the symptoms over time. That sort of also clues you in that this is getting worse. So oh, It brings good. up Let's an important role of the allergist. If I can add something, yeah. Phil, because yeah, sure. yeah. I think that it, you know, this is something that we have to keep in mind. It, it's part of our role is not just to do the evaluation and set a plan, but to follow the patient right. and to ask the same questions. When I see the patient next year, I'm going to say, so how's that oral allergy problem? Have you had any more episodes? Has it gotten worse? We have to really monitor them because it can change. Good. All good comments. And uh, now let's see what we can take home from this case. The course is benign uh, in most uh, individuals, uh, but a small percent of patients may experience a serious event. The severity of subsequent reactions is often totally unpredictable. Uh, and so the NIAID guidelines give us some leeway. Uh, they, uh, they are broadly interpreted and they would allow for administration of an epinephrine auto injector uh, according to the physician's uh, judgment. Now, let's review the overall take home messages. Faculty, uh, what do you think we can sum up uh, the program with? Would you agree? Epinephrine is the number one drug. Administer it quickly and always have two doses. Good. And uh, patients suspected of having food allergy, venom, or medication allergic reactions should always be evaluated by an allergist. And that ends the first half of the show. And now begins the ACE Team lightning round. Uh, all questions are based on those received during the first ACE Team training, uh, training broadcast. Here we go. Uh, I'll take the first one. This drug is the first line therapy for anaphylaxis. A, auto injector of epinephrine. B, Benadryl. C, cortisone. Audience did great. Uh, I think an impact uh, we have made. Well, this is fantastic. Well, our, our, great, our, you know, for the our ACE teams. teams are really on the ball yeah. here. This yeah. is great. I wish I could say as much for all the other physicians and, and people out there who unfortunately think about using other things first, but that's why we have ACE teams because we're going to change what they do. Great. Now, 
Let's go on to the next question. Risk factors that predispose the child or the adult to anaphylaxis fatality are A, previous anaphylaxis event, B, asthma, C, A, and B, and D, none of the above. Although I think the uh, ACE teams are going to answer about both previous anaphylaxis because it's really the number one risk factor for anaphylaxis is previous anaphylaxis to anything. And I do believe they're all going to answer about asthma because we've all been made aware by so many reports that asthma is a, tr is a major risk factor for fatal anaphylaxis to allergy shots, to foods, to pretty much anything. But are there other risk factors that we should keep in mind or that we shouldn't keep in mind. Uh, and I'll offer one, uh, because again, uh, the skin test or serum IgE results are often misunderstood, that if it's really strong, that's a risk factor for a fatal reaction. And we have to keep in mind that severity and fatal reactions are not so predictable. The, the sensitivity level doesn't predict the severity. Any other ideas of what might be, people might be thinking about about risk factors? Sometimes we do associate with adults that following alcohol consumption, there's an increased risk. We also know that we have exercise-induced anaphylaxis where food may be playing a role. And when those two combine, we have an increased risk for anaphylaxis and potential fatality. So there are cofactors that increase the risk. Additional medications such as uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or anti-acids also contribute to increased severity of anaphylactic reactions. Think also delayed administration of epinephrine. This is, you know, in the case report or case series of fatal anaphylaxis, this was a recurring theme. You know, those were the people who have had prior reactions but didn't use epinephrine or use it very late in the course of the, uh, of the reaction. So, I think the message should be that if we know what to do and we teach our patients how to take care of, you know, how to recognize uh, symptoms and how to treat them, they will be safe. Perhaps the biggest risk factor is the attitude that we see with parents, we see with schools, and with the public, and that's watch and wait. You cannot watch and wait. You must administer epinephrine early, or the risk is greater for fatality. David, take a look at what our ACE team member said and see what you think. Our ACE team did pretty well, uh, as we predicted. There were some people who were well aware that asthma was a risk factor, but maybe weren't thinking about previous anaphylaxis as a risk factor. And uh, very few said none of the above. Uh, I guess we're doing pretty well with our ACE teams. Great. And while you're at bat, let me let you take the next question. The only medication that can prevent anaphylactic shock is A, Benadryl, B, epinephrine, C, albuterol. Well, we're back. Uh, Dana, what do you think about that question? Well, hopefully we've gotten the message across. If you never know the right answer, just say epinephrine. It's always right. <laughs> so I think that we, we've convinced our, our at-home faculty and audience that they want to go out and deliver the word to the community that epinephrine is all you have to remember. If you leave the Benadryl behind, it's okay. If you refuse to take the steroids, it's still okay. As long as you have your epinephrine, you're going to have the right first-line treatment. Well, I think what we should emphasize is that epinephrine really works rapidly. If it's given via intramuscular route, you know, it really starts working within a minute. And it's the only drug that addresses all of the mediators of an allergic reaction and counteracts the most severe symptoms. You know, it brings up the blood pressure, open, opens up the airways. So, you know, in addition, epinephrine stabilizes the mast cells, so prevents further release of the mediators. So this is the only, the only drug that can stop it, sort of in the tracks. So and yet we, we still, cannot overemphasize it. And yet we still hear so many people saying, oh, I'll, I'll take Benadryl and it'll prevent things from getting worse. Or last time I took Benadryl, I got better. 
Right. And I, I think there's an important need to say, maybe to elaborate on what you said, that Benadryl takes time to take effect, 20 minutes, 30 minutes at best, probably up to 60 minutes in many people, and by then you're either dead or you're not. So Benadryl is not going to prevent anaphylactic shock. What about cortisone? What? I mean, it's not in the question, but this is what the emergency rooms do a lot, is to give uh, intravenous steroids, expecting that that's going to prevent things from getting worse. And I think we need to keep that in mind also. That doesn't prevent anaphylaxis. Well, they actually use cortisone more frequently than epinephrine in the emergency mm. room. And there's absolutely no evidence that this is a treatment that would work for anaphylaxis. The only evidence there is, is for epinephrine. Well, Dave, how did our ACE team members do on that one? Well, once again, our ACE team really came through. Uh, they are definitely getting the idea. Epi, epi, epi. Well, you know, I just want to say, you know, it's not that we're against those other drugs. There's just a second line of treatment. There's nothing against using albuterol, you know, for somebody who has uh, bronchospasm, but it's after you have used epinephrine or giving them Benadryl, Great but it's point. after. Yep. And on that note, let's you take the next question. Certainly. Patients should give themselves auto-injectors, i.e. epinephrine, A, if they ingested a known allergen and develop any lower airway symptom, B, only after Benadryl has failed, C, only if the patient is dizzy or cannot breathe, or D, A, plus B. We're back again. Dana, tell me what you think the correct answer to that question is. Well, we want to administer epinephrine when we get those lower airway symptoms. We don't want to wait until something else happens. So it has to be a rapid onset of administration as soon as we have identified that we're dealing with anaphylaxis. Again, it's that false sense of security because patients have improved without giving it. I mean, the body's a, a remarkable uh, organ and machine, and we, we, we save ourselves. So many times, we are producing enough epinephrine to allow the anaphylaxis to be controlled, but you never know when it's going to be, when your luck's going to run out, as we said. So anytime you develop those airway symptoms or signs of anaphylaxis, you need to administer epinephrine. What do you think, David? You know, there's some kind of hidden background questions here that are interesting. We get these questions from patients all the time. Uh, this question said if they ingested a known allergen for them and developed symptoms. So, okay, what if the peanut allergic patient uh, realizes, oh my God, I just ate a cookie with peanuts. Now they don't have symptoms. Should they use the epinephrine? And a lot of them are, have been thinking that yes, they should. And there may be some patients where we might even say that actually, no question. Uh, so this question really gets at, you know, they, they already have symptoms. And that, makes, hopefully, to our ACE teams especially, makes it a no-brainer. They have symptoms. They ate the food, they have the symptoms. What do you wait for? Well, I think the, the, the key is the lower airway. You know, any, mm -hmm. any reaction going to the lungs, to the, the airway, the bronchospasm, this is really, you know, like a red flag, okay? This is something that ca can be going bad, you know, really quickly. So, so what if they ate the peanut and broke it in hives? Well, it depends. If those are two hives, you know, here, probably, you know, you're going to give them Benadryl, but if they ate peanut and they're breaking out with hives all over, I'm giving them epinephrine. You know, I may disagree with that. I think that the child has had a severe near-death experience two months ago. They accidentally ingest that cupcake that has nuts in it, and then they develop two hives. What's the danger of giving epinephrine then? So when in doubt, give epinephrine? When in doubt, I would give it. I wouldn't wait until the child had generalized hives because, you know, shock might be the next symptom rather than generalized hives. Well, this is why we're the allergists. This patient had a very severe history, and we're going to make that right. judgment and create an right. individualized plan for this patient about what to do. Now, if that's the point, you know, if you have somebody with a history of life-threatening anaphylaxis, well, you, you know, that's a, that's a different story. Well, let's have our ACE team members uh, moderate this answer. Uh, Dana, Dana, tell me uh, what they said. Okay. It looks like that most of them are on track with our answer and that they would have administered epinephrine 
with those lower airway symptoms. We're getting that message across. Great. Anna, we'll go ahead and take the next question from you now. After using the epinephrine auto-injector, the patient should be taken to the hospital because A, it is possible that symptoms will recur, B, epinephrine is a dangerous medication, C, epinephrine auto-injector be must be disposed of properly. All right, now, you gave us a question. What do you think the right answer is, Anna? Well, I, I think it's um, you know, pretty clear that the right answer is A, uh, that symptoms may recur. You know, we definitely know that there's biphasic anaphylaxis or protracted anaphylaxis, that symptoms may go away with or without treatment and they, they just come back with a vengeance. So uh, this is uh, absolutely critical and the length of observation should be at least four hours you know, from the resolution of the symptoms. This is what we tell our food allergic patients. Epinephrine is not dangerous and you know, I'm sure you can, you can sort of um, comment on it. Uh, it can be given to anybody. I want to challenge our faculty. <laughs> My patient says the reason I didn't give epinephrine is I didn't want to go to the hospital. What is your response to that? That's a really great point, and that's part of this question about epinephrine being a dangerous medication, because that's what some of them think. Oh, it's dangerous, and I don't want to go to the emergency room, so I'm just not going to use it because it's dangerous. So that's really important to be able to communicate to the patients. But again, there are all kinds of reasons that people don't use epinephrine and, and don't want to go to the hospital. We clearly have to say, listen, you need to use epinephrine for this reaction. There are all these reasons that we're going to tell you you also need to go to the hospital, but regardless of what you decide about going to the hospital, you have to use the epinephrine. And then we still think you should go to the hospital. Right. Don't make two mistakes. Right. Don't make two mistakes. Good. Yeah. Want to add anything to that, Anna? Well, I, I always explain to them that, you know, the reason is not that we're afraid of any side effects of epinephrine. There's nothing dangerous about it. It's just that if the reaction is severe enough to warrant the use epinephrine, it means that you have to be evaluated by a physician, somebody who can provide further treatment, and this is really critical. Well, you know, I'll add to that, that uh, and it comes up in our education with the patients, that uh, we're, we're dwelling on epinephrine, 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 but it isn't the only thing that is necessary in patients with anaphylaxis and anaphylactic right. shock. Oxygen, fluids, oxygen, intravenous fluids can be absolutely. critical, so the fact that they use their epinephrine may save their lives but they really need to have the medical attention and comprehensive treatment of anaphylaxis. Let's see the response from our ACE team. So 90% of the ACE teams chose uh, the answer A, uh, which you know, is that it's possible that the symptoms will recur, and 0% uh, thought that the epinephrine is dangerous, which is great, um, and 10% thought that uh, epinephrine auto-injector must be disposed of properly, which is true, uh, but you can, true. Take, you can take it to your allergist, uh, you know, later on, so it's certainly not a reason to uh, go to the hospital. Or to not use your epinephrine. Or not to use your epinephrine, yeah. Right. Good. Now we'll go to the next one, Dave. Until medical help arrives, the adult patient should lay down, with feet, lay down flat with feet and knees above the head, if tolerated. Is this because it will help to prevent shock, or B, to promote relaxation, or C, to prevent an asthma attack? really glad we're back on this one uh, because I learned something when we went over as a faculty uh, this question. We had some disagreement uh, and when one looks at our guidelines, uh, the guidelines quite clearly state uh, that all patients should lie down flat and put their uh, feet elevated. And we got in a little discussion about that and now I'm not sure that uh, that's always correct. Maybe Anna, uh, you can start and then shift over to Dave. Well, I guess I have this perspective of a, a pediatrician or pediatric allergist, and uh, in childhood anaphylaxis, hypotension is, is rare. I have to say that maybe single cases over the past decade that I have taken care of, the most important symptom, uh, the most severe symptom is the lower airway involvement, the asthma, the bronchospasm. 
So can you imagine trying to lay down an infant who is vomiting and, and is having respiratory distress? This is just going to make them worse. So it's, not, it's def definitely not tolerated uh, in this situation. So you know, for adults, it's totally different. Other patients who actually do go into the shock and develop hypotension, you want to maximize this venous cardiac return uh, to give them some uh, pressure. So I, that really addresses what we think the ACE team is going to answer, that the reason that this is recommended is to help prevent shock. Uh, and, and, you know, we've seen this uh, reported and done so many times that when someone's feeling woozy and dizzy, someone says, oh, come sit up, you'll feel better. And right. there are reports that that was the immediate cause of death in some patients with anaphylactic shock. So there's a reason to do that. And when we see patients who have that history that they went into shock, this is one of the important things we should tell them. Epi first, uh, perhaps, and lie down, and that's where you stay until you get medical help. But it's not necessarily appropriate for everyone. And I think we're all still uh, coming to realize that. that uh, and, and, you know, Anna made such a great point that I had to think about it. Uh, in insect sting allergy, uh, although hypotensive shock can occur in 30 plus percent of the adults that we see, less than 5 percent of children have, have hypotensive shock from an insect sting. Right. So this is more of a, ch uh, of a pediatric uh, differentiation and, of course, the individual patient. We, we have to know what they had in the past. It does predict things. The pattern is fairly predictable up to a point. And, and to make the point to the patients, at least, that if this is what they're experiencing, then they need to realize they have to lie down. Dave, let's see what our ACE team members said. Well, our ACE team is, once again, Fantastic. really on the ball here. Uh, they definitely know why we're doing this. They definitely get the idea. This is great. Congratulations to the ACE teams. Dana, let me let you take the next one. Certainly. Patient with a history of anaphylaxis should always carry two epinephrine auto-injectors because A, if they make a mistake, they have, to, they have a backup to use. B, symptoms may return after the initial response to the first dose. C, up to 35% of episodes require two doses. Or D, all of the above. Great, Donna. Now, let me ask, let you answer your own question. Well, I think that our team is, is, right on, is going to be on target. I think they're going to recognize that we've covered all three of these points and that each of them has a particularly good reason for carrying the auto-injector and for using it at the first sign of anaphylaxis, and that you need two doses always on hand. You, you never know when it might misfire. You don't know when it's going to be so severe that you will take a second dose or if there will be a biphasic or a delayed response that you need the second dose. So I believe we're going to do really well on this question. Well, let's see how well we did do. Uh, take a look, Dana, at the response from the ACE team. We did great. They know that all of these specific indications mean you need to carry two. Makes us proud. And Anna, go ahead to your next question. What to tell patients who survive an anaphylactic reaction after using Benadryl? A, you're lucky your body produced enough of its own epinephrine, adrenaline, this time. B, use the epinephrine auto-injector first, take Benadryl second if you'd like. C, epinephrine works immediately on all symptoms and it's the only medication that can prevent or treat shock. D, all of the above. Back again, and uh, Anna, let's hear the answer to that question in your opinion. Well, I mean, it's obvious to us that the answer to this question is D, all of the above. And I think this is a, such a good question because it brings this important issue that da Dana actually addressed before, is that, you know, people go through anaphylax anaphylaxis and they survive sometimes without anything or sometimes with Benadryl. And 
It's because we produce our own endogenous adrenaline. Like when we get a reaction, this is a stress. We just put out all of those mediators that help us, but we don't know, you know, next time how lucky you're going to be. So you really cannot rely on that body to, to take care of, of this every time. Um, obviously, you know, epinephrine is the first line of treatment. You cannot wait for Benadryl for 20 minutes to, for this to start working. You wanted something that works within a minute, within two minutes, really that, you know, gets you going. Um, and, you know, we said that before, this is the only medication that sort of addresses all of the aspects, uh, antagonizes all of the mediators of the allergic reaction. Well, Anna, let's see what our ACE team members said. So, I think they did great because majority uh, chose answer D, as we would like to see. And obviously, you know, they're getting the message across. We are getting the message and they're getting it. <laughs> Wonderful. David, let's go to the next one. You know, I'm, I'm going to go back to that one for one second. I can't yeah. resist Good. it because I, I, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, I did all of that. I had a patient and I went over all of this and the patient still came back and said, you know, I think you're wrong, doctor. It's ha I've had three episodes and I always took Benadryl and within 10 minutes I was better. So the Benadryl works fine. I think that's all I'm going to do next time. It amazes me and we, yeah. we, it, I guess it just reinforces to me the importance of trying to find the right way to get through to the patients and make them understand that Benadryl takes a lot longer than that to work. If they got better in 10 minutes, it wasn't because of the Benadryl. And that fortunately, thank goodness, the mortality from anaphylaxis is what, one to 2%? So, but you don't want to be one of the one to 2%. Right. Use that epinephrine. You know, since you've made that statement, I think we really do need more research on this endogenous epinephrine mm -hmm. release mm -hmm. so that we can convince not only our physicians but patients that this is indeed the case. We have some animal yeah. studies, but we don't have good human data on that. I often explain to the patient, you know when you almost have an accident and you, you screech to a, a stalt at that stoplight or red light and all of a sudden your heart's blah, 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 that's the epinephrine working. But what if it doesn't happen? What if that doesn't get released or you need more than you right. can produce? Then is when your luck ran out. Well, yep. David, <laughs> okay. let's go on to the next one. Let's go. Next question. At what point is the second epinephrine dose given? A, five to 10 minutes, B, if symptoms recur within a few hours, or C, A and B. Good, back again, and we really had a great discussion, but we've got a lot of questions to get through, so I'm gonna hurry through the next ones if we can, see how many we can get through before we close. So, uh, what do you think about that? What's the answer to that one, David? Uh, I'm gonna say that A and B, that the, the answer C is, is correct. Uh, five to 10 minutes, you know, epinephrine takes about that long to start working. If the patient is not improving or getting worse, of course, within five to 10 minutes, it's time to use that second dose. What are you waiting for? It doesn't, you don't have to wait 15 minutes to give it a chance to work. Mm -hmm. If the patient's getting worse, it's time. And certainly if symptoms come back, and we've been talking about biphasic anaphylaxis and the fact that it happens in an awful lot of patients, more, more than you would guess. You look at all the studies and they're up there 30, 40, 60 percent even in the severe reactions. So hopefully our ACE teams answered A and B. Great. David, let's see what our uh, ACE team members said. They did. They said A and B. We're getting there. We're making progress. And uh, Dana? Let's hear your question. Certainly. Now, I want you to pay a special attention to this question. It's not as easy as the last one. A 21-year-old with a history of insect sting anaphylaxis is stung and develops generalized hives. He has his epinephrine auto-injector. What should he do? A, use the epinephrine and seek emergency treatment. B, take an antihistamine and see if other symptoms develop. C, call the doctor's office and ask for advice. Good. 
Anna, that's a hot question. Tell me what you think. Well, we may not all agree on this one, but I would choose A. Because this is an adult with generalized urticaria, higher risk of going into more severe anaphylaxis type symptoms, and when in doubt, even if you're not sure, always use epinephrine. So I'd go with answer A. Everybody agree with that one? Absolutely. A has to be the answer. You know, there are all kinds of circumstances. We can come back to talking about that, but A has to be the answer. Let's see what our H team member said, Donna. Well, again, we were a little bit more divided on this one. 70% would have agreed with me, A, and about 25% would have said they would give an antihistamine and wait. That's great. We have a, a little easier one now, uh, uh, Anna. Uh, let's go to the next one. Patients who develop a large local reaction to first insect stings or bites should A, be evaluated by an allergist, B, carry an epinephrine autoinjector, C, apply a cold compress, D, A, and C. Was me. I don't think that's an easier one. I think it may be a harder one. What well, do you think? I think I'll need some help here <laughs> because um, certainly they need to be evaluated by an allergist. Um, obviously, you want to provide some relief when they have, you know, big local swelling, and um, you know, they you might consider, you know, giving them epinephrine. But I'm not an expert. Here's the expert on insect stings. And you know what? Two it's, seconds. It's a, it is a hard question. There's there's nothing direct about this. We're, we're, I think we're all going to agree that the reason to see an allergist is not because it was such a bad reaction, but to get really correct and accurate information about the chance of a more severe reaction and to feel out the situation about whether they should have an epinephrine injector because it would make them feel better. Uh, as Dana said, if they ask for it, then we should educate them and maybe allow them to have it. Uh, but it was just a large local reaction. We have to remember that there's a 5 to 10 percent chance of a systemic reaction in children or adults with large local reactions. But on the subject, I'm actually going to make a quick comment about the previous question, because when we talked about the person breaking out in hives, that was a 21-year-old. That's true. Right. What if it was a 7-year-old? Harder and question. We go back, much harder, <laughs> because we go back to the fact that the great majority of children with insect sting uh, systemic reactions have only hives. So there's a lot less chance of it progressing. And children really are, uh, they get special consideration for food, and they get special consideration for stings. Good. Anna, let's see what our audience, what our ACE team members said. Uh, our ACE team members were quite divided on this one, so it wasn't really easy. David, now comes a little bit of an easier one. Let me let you take <laughs> this. So, next question. Which cause of anaphylaxis is most common in children? A, drug allergy. B, stinging or biting insect venom allergy. C, food allergy. Well, David, what do you think the correct answer to that question is? You're right. This is an easy one. Food allergy, food allergy, food allergy. No question. You know, it's the number one cause of anaphylaxis in all age groups. And children definitely take the cake, pardon the pun. Let me see what our, what our mm -hmm. we're running out of time. Mm -hmm. So let me see what our, uh, what our team member said. David? They, they definitely went for the food allergy. Is there any reason not to think that, Anna? Well, I, I just want to point out, I, I totally agree, this is definitely the most common cause of anaphylaxis outside of the hospital uh. setting. So, you know, we're talking about anaphylaxis that happens, so iatrogenic, you know, in the hospital, then it's a breakdown that's slightly different, because then drugs, radio contrast media sort of come in, and latex mm -hmm. um, as important cause. But at large, outside in the real world, is food for everybody. And the, and the concern is food allergy is getting worse. We're seeing more and more, we're, we're particularly in to. children. I, I love all this. We're going to have to, I, I'm getting buzzing in my ear and telling me to go on and faster and faster. So I've got to get you guys to quit talking for a minute because I've been asked to skip over now and go to one of our favorite questions. I'm going to go ahead and take this one. I don't like this question, but everybody else did. Okay. This is a toddler who developed hives after being kissed on a cheek by his mom who had just eaten peanuts. 
A mom should a should be given a prescription for two epinephrine auto injectors. B taught how to administer auto injectable epinephrine to a baby. C told to seek emergency treatment after the first dose of epinephrine. D refer to an allergist for full evaluation and testing. And E all of the above. Uh, Anna, since you are the pediatric allergist on this panel, uh, we'll let you take the first shot. We've got about three or four minutes. Okay, I, I get the easy one, right, at the end. Yeah, right. So, um, no, I would say all of the above. And I think I would just want to make it clear that this is, you know, this is about the risk for anaphylaxis. So this hive on the cheek after, you know, exposure to peanut, you know, so suggests that there is a possibility this child is allergic to peanut. So it has to be, this diagnosis has to be confirmed by, you know, evalu full evaluation. In the meantime, to keep this child safe, you know, it's very reasonable to provide epinephrine and to instruct the parents what is anaphylaxis, when to use it, you know, how, how do you proceed. However, you know, this cannot be, you know, a, a permanent diagnosis of peanut allergy. It has to be followed by evaluation because it may or may not. But if, as long as we don't know, we have to keep them safe. That's the priority number one. David. No, I agree. And I think a lot of our team members may be... Uh, not answering the A, B, and C and thinking that seeing an allergist is the right thing, which it is, of course. But uh, as Anna said, until they see the allergist, they really need to know what to do in case it happens again and gets worse, because it can't. And you know, what I want to know is how would a primary care audience answer this mm. question? Right. Because that's really the message we need as ACE faculty and audience to deliver to the community, and that is whenever there is any doubt that a child or an adult is, has a potential for developing life-threatening anaphylaxis, it's much better to prescribe and have equip that person with emergency treatment before they get to the allergist. You have another comment? Well, I, I guess the, uh, only uh, my other comment is that, you know, for very young, you know, babies, the infants, you know, under six, you know, six months to 12, 12 months, you know, the, 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 the small dose is, is, even the lower dose is, is an over, overdose for them. So that gets a little bit more complicated. But, but if when it's adult, the only thing you have, right, if that's I, only and there is a severe reaction, I would administer that dose, even right. if it's a little higher than would be yeah, ideal. That's, that's what we would do. And we want to communicate that to the community too. Right. Well, great. Super duper discussion. Thank you all. And wow, uh, that was a quick uh, 60 minutes, uh, and, and I hope today's program was as informative for you as it was fun and uh, interesting for us. Uh, please help me thank our great faculty members, Anna nowak Wurzen, uh, David Golden, and Dana Wallace. And to you, we're glad you could join us, and we look forward to seeing the results of your ACE programs. Now, back to Tari and Barber with some important messages for all ACE themes. Thank you, Dr. Lieberman. And while we're thanking people, we can't forget Carol Jones, the ACE team faculty advisor, Steve Sulkin, president and CEO of MBM Productions International, and Nancy Sander, president and founder of ANMA, who developed the concept of allergist and community laypersons working together to transform anaphylaxis awareness and treatment. Now it's time for ACE teams to start planning your three educational and outreach programs and three media activities. Your ACE binders will answer most questions, but if you need help, contact Carol Jones, our RN, or me. Our contact information is in the front of your binder. Concluding this presentation, you will receive an email with an invitation to set up your username and password to the ACE website, where you'll be able to access PowerPoint slides, handouts, dialogue with other ACE teams, complete the project planning worksheets, and submit reports. Did I mention submit reports? <laughs> Before you go, a quick reminder. The next ACE broadcast is on August 18th, 2011. Dr. Dana Wallace is joined by an expert panel to discuss food anaphylaxis at school 
and then heads into the kitchen with famed chef Ron Hutmacher to show us how to feast fantastically with food allergies. You won't want to miss this exciting show. I'm Torian Barber. See you at the next ACE broadcast. ACEs is a partnership program developed and offered by Allergy and Asthma Network, Mothers of Asthmatics, and the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and made possible by Day Pharma LP.